Brothers and sisters, I'm happy to be here this afternoon, and my one hope is that the message will not be clouded by the messenger. Several uh, months ago, my daughter and I had an opportunity to visit the Powell House in Williamsburg, in the colonial Williamsburg area. While we were there taking the tour, the tour guide mentioned that Mr. Powell was an undertaker. Immediately, it flashed through my mind all my childhood memories of my best friend's father, who was a mortician. As I looked around in the Powell House, I couldn't help but think what an odd mortuary this was, and I started to race through all the experiences I had in a mortuary as a child. Then my thoughts were interrupted by the tour guide, who made the comment, an important comment I might add, that an undertaker in the 1700s was not a mortician, but was a contractor or a carpenter, a builder of homes. I was a little embarrassed at my thoughts racing through thinking about this man, Mr. Powell, being a mortician, a mortician, and not a contractor. My wife and I recently finished building a home, and while we were building that, I oft thought of what my contractor might have thought had I referred to him as my mortician. Although, for those of you who have ever built a home financially, you do die at that experience, so it might have been appropriate. <clears throat> when we start to look at things in a historical nature, Oft, what takes place is we impose our modern conceptions upon historical experiences, similar to the undertaker and contractor experience in Williamsburg, uh, in my experience in Virginia. We have gathered together today at a symposium entitled Voices of the Prophets, especially the Old Testament prophets, voices from the past that speak from the dust, and we, as participants, almost act as if we know those dusty voices, those prophets of old. Not necessarily individually, because I don't think that that is the point, it was to know them personally and up close, but as the prophets or the oracles of God, collectively. Now, perhaps many of us here in the audience today, we do understand the notion of Old Testament prophecy and the Old Testament prophet. Some of us, perhaps, may need a refresher's course of what the Old Testament prophet was. And there may be many of us who fall in either category who view the Old Testament prophet through 20th century perspective or shades. Now what I mean by that is this is a historical problem with, with any historical study is where we look at concept as mentioned previously with the modern concepts to historical principles. So we may be viewing what we think a prophet is by today, our experiences, and say that that must have been what prophets were like in the Old Testamental periods. Now this presentation is entitled The Prophetic Leader in Israel. With that title, I would hope and I would ask you just for the next few moments, if you could, and I don't know if this is altogether possible, but if you could lay aside your presentism, the notion of our modern viewpoint upon historical concepts, if you could lay aside your presentism baggage for just the few moments that we speak about a prophet and a leader. As mentioned, I don't know if we can do that. But if we could, perhaps we could go to an ancient text and find something that is distinctly new or distinctly important for a modern principle. If we could do this, perhaps we could better understand the way that the Hebrews conceived leadership and the notion of prophets. Well, when we start to talk about these things, I think that perhaps we should look at a few words in the title itself. First of all, we will talk about leaders or leadership. Now, the modern viewpoint of leaders is a gobbledygook of a mess. As a matter of fact, when we speak of leaders or leadership, many of us start to think of titles or positions, roles. We think of characteristics or personality traits, charisma. We have oft perhaps said the title is, that person has leadership capabilities, perhaps by the way that they act. In business, we find leaders are those who can turn a profit or increase profit margin, perhaps. This is the, pers the perspective or the shades of those who wear the modernist viewpoint. Now, as we start to talk about Old Testament leadership, then maybe we should, well, not maybe, we should take away that viewpoint as if we could and look at what they thought of leadership. As a matter of fact, Roast, who is an avid researcher of historical leadership venues, has come to the conclusion when it comes to modern day leadership, a leader is a word that means all things to all people. Now let's take a look at the next term, that of a prophet. When we speak of a prophet, perhaps our 20th century peers 
begin to have visions of a wild-haired, long-robed, bearded, sign-toter proclaiming the end is near. I actually saw one of these recently down off the hill at the university. I pulled my car over to talk to this long-robed man and had to wait in line, for there are many students who were waiting in line to see him as well and have their picture taken with him to send back to their parents, Mom, I have converted. And uh, finally, I got to speak with this man. Interesting concept of a prophet for some, perhaps those who consider themselves sophisticated view prophets as such. But we also have a surprising number of late who would view prophets as perhaps comet-chasing zealots or misinformed or malaligned messiahs who provide new salvation. And it seems that typically many of those who prophesy these new salvations are the easy steps without any effort where we can find peace and happiness and rest of our souls. But perhaps the greatest majority of those in modernity here in the 20th century that view that of prophets are viewing a prophet perhaps out of a dictionary term, which, by the way, is somewhat accurate. It's the notion of prophetus, which comes from the Greek, and it seems that the prophetic notion for the majority of those of our peers of this time look at as a prophet as one who is an accurate prognosticator, or someone who simply, or a person who tells what will happen. This strikes me at odd, for within this group there is a long range of the pendulum, from one end, it's those perspectives, perhaps, of the biblical prophecies, those who have done prophecies of signs of the times, etc. But it has swung to the other end also, where we find those here in the 20th century who view a prophet as one who prophesies the future, that takes the notion where it's almost become tabloid-esque in a sense, where it's the notion of biblical prophecies that the government doesn't want you to know about, or they look at prophecy, uh, prophets as those individuals who can prognosticate the future and have predictions that come true for 1997. And this stuff is gobbled up. As a matter of fact, I found it interesting, the reaction of the store clerk as I purchased these when I tried to convince her that I was purchasing them for research alone. And she, I don't know if she believed me, but it's interesting how many people look at prophets in this viewpoint. That is why I ask, just for the next few moments, if we can to shirk our visions of prophets and our visions of leaders from all of the things, perhaps, that are imposed upon us because of our experience here in the 20th century. As a matter of fact, I have read volumes of books concerning Old Testament prophets written by scholars where prophets were discussed in light of what they do or how they did it. They were talked about rapture or the experience of working into a frenzy to receive prophecy and how they received revelation. As a matter of fact, the, the sad part about this is when we look at that perspective and narrow it down with modern notions of the means rather than the ends, perhaps we lay in danger of missing the entire point. As a matter of fact, F.G. Bailey made an insightful comment, and I quote, without taking the broad cultural setting into account, together with the unique set of historically defined preferences and priorities. What is most significant about leadership will be missed. If we remove the historical aspect, if we remove the historical preferences, the, the priorities of the people of past, perhaps as he states here, we miss the whole essence of what leadership is. Now it would be nice, well it would be phenomenal if we could have a an Old Testament leader, an Old Testament prophet from the past be transported here by some means to come and visit us. It would have been a great presentation to be able to look in your program and find that Moses was actually coming to speak at the Sperry Symposium. My, what crowds we would have. But as far as I can tell, the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament leaders, there aren't any of them left. So we must take what has been left for us, primarily that of their words, and their stories and their practices, the text from the Old Testament. And then hopefully we can get a, a, a glimpse of what it was for historical leadership and the historical viewpoint of the Old Testament prophet. Now, let's look first at the notion of leadership or leaders. The word leadership never appears in the Old Testament text of the Hebrew Bible. I found that interesting when I far, first started to, to look through this. As a matter of fact, interesting to me was the fact that I couldn't even find the term leadership in any of the older Hebrew lexicons. It seems very clear that our term leadership is a 20th century creation, something that begins to appear in dictionaries right around the turn of the century. To assume, however, that we did not have leaders prior to that point would be erroneous at best. 
And we find the word leader, however, throughout the Old Testament text. When we look in our Old Testament text to try to ascertain what the Hebrew or the Old Testament leader was, we find that our word leader in English is actually translated from three Hebrew source words. Those three words are nagid, nasi, and sar. When we look at those three words, historically we find that they are etymologically or tied historically together. They are linked. Now, when we look at the textual definition, that will help us understand Old Testament leadership. But there's something we must look as well, and that's the composite whole, the contextual meaning as well as the textual. Now, with that in mind, these three words give a nice flavor to the Old Testament leader. For example, when we start to look at the notion of Nagid, we find that etymologically these three words converge upon one single meaning, that notion of an announcer or a proclaimer, or more specifically, as Barth suggested, it was a spokesman, one who speaks for another. Now, when I say for another, we must look at that in the whole term. A spokesman often is also viewed as one who speaks the words of another. But there's a unique tie here, words of another and those who speak for another. And this is where the next term, that of nasi, comes in and provides insight. When we find the notion of nasi, contextually we find from the book of Numbers in chapter 13 that the Lord asks the prophet to gather together one nasi. Now the King James Version, by the way, defines or interprets that as a ruler. One ruler from each tribe to survey the new land. Etymologically, however, if we look at the meaning of the word, we find that the Lord is asking one nasi, or spokesman, from each tribe to survey the new land. And they come from the people, recognized by the people as the tribal spokesman. No doubt would these individuals speak the words of the tribe. But the interesting part in the contextual situation here is that they also speak for the tribe. They have an authoritative sponsorship, so to speak, the signature of authority about them. Now finally, if we look at the last word of leader, that of sar, we see an interesting notion. Not only interesting, but I believe it is imperative to understand the Hebrew or the Old Testament leader itself. When we look at sar, it is often interpreted as a, as a head, that's the literal translation, or one who is at the head, the notion of an official, the notion of a priest, and even kings come from the word sar. But there's something that's very vital here when we look historically at the word. As a matter of fact, Brown, Driver, and Briggs have said that the, the Tsar is a vassal, a noble, and an official. Now, here's the important part. But it's a, a vassal, a noble, and an official, but one who is still under the king. Now, when we speak of this, this becomes very important because even the king is translated from Tsar on occasion. So if we look at the hierarchical notion of leadership, as one goes forth, as we would say by today's standards, and moves up the ladder of leadership, even if one obtains the position of king in Hebrew leadership, that individual is still subservient to a higher power. It wouldn't be uncommon, therefore, to find the Hebrew king as being one who was anointed or consecrated, where his service is set aside to serve the almighty power. Perhaps this is the most important aspect of, of Old Testament leadership is the highest order of leader. The notion of he who holds our, all power was the king of kings, even Jehovah. So while one was the king of the people, they were still under the notion of servitude to the king Jehovah. Now, therefore, if we look at this notion of spokesmanship as the Hebrew leader, we find that this is an important aspect of what a leader was. Now, the next question typically comes as well, who were the leaders, therefore, of the Old Testament? Who were, more appropriately, who were the spokesmen? Now, typically, when we think of spokesmen of the Old Testament, here we come to our, our symposium of today, which is the notion of the voice of the prophets. However, that might be a jump because we just assume the prophets were the spokesmen. Now, when we start to look at that, therefore, let's look at the word of the prophet. The term prophet that we use comes primarily from four Hebrew source words. Those are Nabi, Naba, Jose, and also that of Netaf. Now, these source words, also etymologically linked or tied together, give an interesting perspective of the Old Testament prophet. 
As a matter of fact, when we look at these four words combined together, and I'm going to review just three of them, and then we'll pick up Jose together when we look at the contextual conceptions or the connotation of the prophet. When we look at all four of these words, however, they are directly tied to a single definition which seems very appropriate, and that is a spokesman. Therefore, when we look at this notion of spokesmanship, it's almost as if we cannot ignore the prophet as a leader or vice versa. It's not part of, of leadership, but they are synonymous terms. The prophet was a leader and vice versa on, on most occasions. Now, an important part of this prophetic spokesmanship, however, is the notion if we look at that from Nabi, the word for prophet. Many researchers feel that etymologically this is directly tied to a source root from the Akkadian, which is Nabu, which gives the notion of one who not only calls forth, and this is an important clarification, but is also important in understanding as they defined it, one who is called. Thus, as Flanders described this, the prophets of Israel were called of Yahweh or Jehovah to announce Yahweh's word. So it wasn't simply one who spoke the words of God or Jehovah, but it was those who spoke for Jehovah as well. Now this neatly ties back into our conversation early with the definition of what a leader was. One who speaks the words of God, but also speaks for God. It's a, it's a wonderful concept. Now, when we start to look at that experience, therefore, some of us, we get a little bit nervous because of our modern perspective. I mean, in a church versus state mentality, this seems to grate at this whole flavor of political uh, intrigue here in our society today. But for others, this seems to, to embark a grateful, heartfelt notion or longing that a prophet would be the leader of a group of people, a community, or a nation, or the world. Well, whether it grates or it is grateful, I think it is important to understand the impact the prophet had of the biblical society in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, many Old Testament scholars have stated that not only were they important, but as F.H. Wood stated, that they were the most important element in the community at the time. As a matter of fact, other scholars have stated, and I quote, the biblical prophet was a dominant position unparalleled in Hebrew history, end of quote. So when we start to talk about prophets, and regardless how we view them in our perspective today, it seems that in the early times of the Old Testament, the prophet was one who was holding a position of power, who had a significant impact upon community and the society. Now, although we look at this Hebrew leader, prophet, as the prophetic leader or spokesman, there seems to be something more to the Hebrew prophet. Now, the reason I mention this is because there are those who feel that others, contemporaries of the Old Testament Hebrews, that they too had Nabi. As a matter of fact, you'll find in the Mari letters as well as the Lachish letters that the word Nabi even comes forth, and they define those prophets as messengers, often divine messengers. The Greeks had their oracles. We find that the Babylonians, that they had their astrologers. Others had crystal gazers, the notions of prophecies uh, that were given, or prognostications. We find the situation where many of them were even cons considered as divine messengers. So one might be tempted to say that this was a common experience amongst all the people at the time of the Old Testament. However, when we start to look at the notion of the Hebrew prophet, here's where we begin to dig. As a matter of fact, Sperry, whose symposium this name bears, once talking of the notion of the Hebrew prophet, made this statement. That the Old Testament prophet when we look at that, the prophet in the, he, uh, the, excuse me, that none had a prophet in the Hebrew connotation of the word. While some may look textually and say, well, wait, we had textually the same experience. As Sperry mentions here, there are none that had a prophet like the Hebrews had in the Hebrew connotation of the word. So therefore, we must expand from the textual connotation or that notion there to see what else is lying within the Old Testament text concerning this wonderful prophetic leader or spokesman, the notion here that we're talking of the prophet. For example, when we look at the whole picture, we find that the Old Testament spokesman was often given titles or described by practices or roles that were common to the prophet. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, Moses was called the man of God, ish Ha'elohim. With the man of God title, many feel that this was an honorary title given to the great prophet of old. 
However, this title was a lasting title and was used through generations. It was often attributed to others who were also connotated as that notion of a nabi or a prophet or leader, the spokesman. Now, when we see this experience with the man of God, there are those who jump to the conclusion that this would indicate that Moses was a godly man. Now, we would assume that the prophetic leaders of, of the Old Testament were godly men. That would seem to make sense, and we would hope that that would be the case. But as we dig deeper, we find that not only does it have that element of godly men, but they were of the possessive nature of this term. They were God's men. They were men who were called of God. We come back to that Akkadian root word of one who was called. And when we see this, we see that the power still lies within the ultimate king. Next, the Hebrew notion of the word Jose, or which we interpret as seer, is often uh, uh, linked with the notion or defined as the notion of one who looks or one who sees. Now, we find even our own theology and even that within the Old Testament that there is somewhat of a debate, is, is one a prophet or is one a seer? Because one obviously cannot be both. But we find if we look deeper that perhaps they can stand side by side. Perhaps while they are still distinct, they are very similar as far as what happens within this prophetic leader of the Old Testament. Now, when I say that, I think that there's an important insight that comes from one who sees or one who looks. A spokesman seems to be clearly one who speaks God's word or speaks as God would speak. But when one is a prophet seer, the notion there of the prophetic leader of ancient days, then as a seer, perhaps it is one who sees the importance of God's words, sees how the message fits in, the importance of the message to the people, the grander vision with the vista included. Or even more importantly, we see that the notion of the prophet seer is one who speaks as God speaks, but also one who sees as God sees. What a powerful concept to the prophetic leader. Now, to some, it might seem a heady concept to be able to speak God's words and see as God sees. Perhaps the danger in this, the ultimate danger, would be that they would consider themselves as God. However, when we look at the Old Testament prophetic leader, by definition, even textual definition, and by the roles assigned and encapsulated within this person, they are reminded that no matter how great, how noble, how loved, how popular, or I might even interject here, how unpopular, however they become in notion of speaking for God and as God speaks, they are still, by the title that we see throughout the Old Testament, a servant of Jehovah. Smith, an Old Testament scholar, felt that this was the most important of all the titles that was attributed to the Nabi or the prophet, perhaps because this was a constant reminder of whom they should serve. As a matter of fact, when we look at the notion of servant of Jehovah, servant comes from that of Ebed, which is the notion of bondsman or man bonded to something. This isn't a casual commitment, but it's the notion of servitude where this defines the very essence of the person in the role. Now, Moses painfully learned this experience when we look in the book of Numbers in chapter 20, where he, standing at the rock of Horeb, had the experience with the water coming forth to quench the thirst of the children of Israel. Moses, unfortunately, not following instructive uh, uh, pattern given by the Lord himself, and perhaps as some might consider, taking credit for the experience where he said that we must fetch you water out of this rock, referring to Aaron and Moses, is the situation of what happens where perhaps where he was stepping out from underneath his servant's cloak. Moses was chastised for this experience because he sanctified not Jehovah, in the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses, perhaps even though it was for a brief moment, removed the cloak of servitude, and as that of a prophetic spokesman, no longer spoke the words directly, perhaps, but even in that brief moment, became perhaps more of the candle rather than the candlestick holder, as was known for these servants of Jehovah. Well, the servant of Jehovah, we find by role, was not simply one who would step forth and represent Jehovah to the people. Although we do find this throughout the text, Moses is a great example of this, we find also the notion where the prophet leader was one who would intercede or represent the people to Jehovah. It was a two-way street. 
As a matter of fact, it was the fearful people who asked Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 5 that he would go closer and hear all that our Lord, our God, tells you, and we will willingly do it. So here he is bid by his people to be their representative to Jehovah, and then he becomes Jehovah's representative to the people. An interesting experience. And there, we hope, as the people state in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we will willingly do it. I worry a little bit about that in my historical understanding of the Old Testament and the children. We will willingly do it. In my estimation, Moses was the most overworked and underpaid babysitter in the history of mankind. And when I see statements like they will willingly do it, perhaps that's after they are fed and after they have water and their needs met, etc. I don't want to be too judgmental because that seems to smack also of our time as well. So great was the intercessory role of these prophetic leaders that we find them praised in the book of Psalms as intercessors. We find them nostalgically referred to with warm hearts from prophets of other generations. And we find that biblical scholars look at the prophetic leader of Israel as the great exemplars of intercession. And I think that's an important concept. Well, finally, we find that the Old Testament spokesman was a watchman. Now Cain was reproved for his snide remark where he said, am I my brother's keeper? It seems that in the gospel that we are, in, we, are, uh, we are required to watch over each other. And perhaps this was the notion which we learn here from Genesis chapter 4. It seems, however, that watching over is not a simple nice thing that a prophet or a prophetic leader should do but it was an important role of the very construct of the Old Testament prophet. As a matter of fact, we find that Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, we go go all the way to a situation where we go to Joseph and Moses, warn and forewarn. Even Malachi has warned and forewarned for those who of us today are far from the wall which he stood upon. But he saw something as a watchman on the tower to give us that experience. And perhaps he who was referred to textually as the watchman, even Isaiah, is still having the aspect where he gives us something to be looking in his warnings and forewarnings with regard to the Messiah. What a wonderful concept. Now, I think that the metaphor of a watchman on a tower is incredibly appropriate for the prophetic leader of Israel. One standing on a tower has the capability to warn and forewarn those in the wall because he has a unique vantage point. Now, this is important. Important because we find that the watchman on the tower not only has a unique perspective of the vistas outside the wall, but he also has a wonderful perspective of what is taking place within the walls. As a matter of fact, it was Flanders that wrote, and I quote, that he, the, the prophet fought with tongue and pen, and even life itself to save the nation from the attacks of its outward foes and from the social and religious dissension which disturbed it within. The prophetic leader therefore warns and forewarns of things on the outside as well as the influences coming within. Therefore, when we see the prophetic leader in Israel, we find what takes place is we have an official representative. But we find a spokesman who spoke the words and the will of Jehovah. But most importantly, and I hope that this could be underscored, and if I cannot, then I have failed, is that the prophetic spokesman of the Old Testament emphasized that Jehovah was the king. It's almost as if one can come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter, and I'm not diminishing the role of the Old Testament prophets, but almost as if it doesn't matter who was standing as the prophetic leader as long as the source was clear. As a matter of fact, Cecil Roth suggests that the prophets were drawn from, quote, all ranks of society from the highest to the lowest. They were courtiers, priests, shepherds, and plowmen. Now, if you think about that from the Old Testament, we have a broad range of personalities, methods, and manners within the Old Testament prophets when compare them. By the way, we could do that by today's standards as well and find that the prophets have different uh, messages as far as their emphasis in the manner by which they present them. But yet here stands clear is the notion that these individuals 
stand as those who hold up almost a transparent experience so that they might see the King of Kings, even Jehovah himself. And I believe that this is perhaps the forgotten beauty of the prophets. Not how many predictions are correct, but through them we see Jesus Christ, Jehovah the King of Kings. Now with this, and with any historical study, I hope that the benefit that comes from such a presentation would be, would be a keen understanding of what Sperry called the Hebrew connotation of the prophetic leader. Now, with this in mind, once we understand historically the very foundation of prophets and leadership, I think that this creates a mold or a pattern. And as Joseph Smith found in Doctrine and Covenants, section 52, the patterns provide the saints with a protection from deception. So therefore, brothers and sisters, if you can find a prophet who fits this Old Testament pattern of leadership, may I simply suggest, follow him. Make him your leader with all of its wonderful ramifications. Place him at the forefront and the head. For if he truly fits this pattern, in him you will find Christ, the King of Kings. I can't help think of a song that I have heard sung on many occasions with zest and zeal. A song that comes from children. Yes, even in a scholarly symposium, the mentioning of a primary song. But perhaps that is the scholarship of heart. And I have heard this song sung in my own home from my own children with great fervor. A song entitled, Follow the Prophet. And by the way, when we come to the chorus, I hope you won't think that I'm stammering or trying to remember the words for being repetitive. I can't help but think of Alma in chapter 5 where he stated again and again, Remember, oh remember. The chorus of this primary song, which fits the application of our message when we understand prophetic leadership, goes as such. Follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet, don't go astray. Follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet, he knows the way. In its simple message, one can answer the question, how does he know the way? The prophet of God speaks as God speaks. He sees as God sees, and his incomplete essence and leadership is to perform the work that God would do. Because of this, I bear testimony we may rest in peace. Or as Elder Eyring said just this last May in a small faculty gathering, and I quote, he, by the way, I should just say he stopped in mid-sentence and said, quote, Gordon B. Hinckley is a prophet of God, that alone will make you sleep better at night. End of quote. May I bear you my testimony that we have been blessed in mortality with prophets from the Old Testament times, and I believe with all my heart that we have individuals who stand as prophetic leaders today. And because of that, we might find rest, even sleep, in our souls and in our hearts. May we be blessed to follow the prophets so that we might not go astray. May we be blessed to follow the prophets of both old, new, and present day testaments or covenants, for they know the way is my humble prayer and testimony. And I say this in his name, who is literally the King of Kings, Jehovah God Almighty. Even Jesus Christ. Amen. A set of four video cassettes featuring eight lectures from the 1997 Sperry Symposium, The Old Testament, Voices of the Prophets, is available from the BYU Creative Works catalog by calling 1-800-962-8061 
or visit us online at the address on your screen. The cost is $29.95 plus shipping and handling.